Today I'm going to be putting Virginia up against Virginia Tech in an NCAA football rebuild, and they'll be racing each other to see who can complete more challenges than the other school. What makes this different from every other rebuild though is I'm going to have very little control over what happens, as all I can do is spectate these colleges' games, and I've put them in separate divisions in the ACC, but they will play each other every season. The winner of that matchup will get to spin the wheel of upgrades to help them out, and they'll be competing with each other on the field during tons of recruiting battles, and ultimately to see who can knock off more challenges. I'll be spectating these two teams for 20 seasons or until somebody completes all five, and it's a race between these two rivals to see who wins the first ever 1v1 NCAA football rebuild. Also, I want to do this versus some other YouTubers as well, so if you like the concept, comment who I should face off against below. To start things off, we have to mention team overalls, and the Hokies have a two-point advantage over the Cavaliers, so it should be no surprise that Virginia is supposed to finish last in their division, while Virginia Tech could finish fourth in theirs. It doesn't really make much of a difference, though, because both teams are not supposed to be good with Virginia Tech at 91 and then Virginia down here at 105, and we're going to see these rosters change a lot over the course of the rebuild, but they are pretty similar from the starting point. The Cavaliers have senior quarterback Tony Musket, while right behind him there's a sophomore that's a 76, while the Hokies have junior Kyron Drones, and there's a freshman redshirt that's a 77 in Pop Watts in the third. Now for recruiting throughout this entire thing, this is what the settings will look like, so I won't be touching a thing, but I will be able to spectate and see what type of players they're going after, and there's going to be a lot of battles for the same guys. On the Hokies board, they definitely have some higher overalls that they're targeting, but we'll see which of those players they actually go after, and we're just going to simulate to when they play Virginia. Remember, the winner of this matchup every year gets to spin the upgrade wheel, and that makes the Commonwealth Cup super important. I really don't plan on following much in recruiting until we start to see some commits, but this is what the Hokies have gone after so far. While this is what Virginia's board looks like, it's so weird not being able to do any recruiting myself, but Mike Stewart would be a great prospect to land. Anyway, going into this crucial game, the Cavaliers beat Florida State while the Hokies have lost one of theirs, so Virginia's favored even though they're on the road, and it might be a while before they're competing for championships, but winning a spin on the upgrade wheel would definitely help one of these schools get ahead. I figured that it would probably be close, but it was a 21-point win for the Cavaliers on the road, and somehow Tony Musket has them still undefeated this season. Now we're headed over to the wheel for the first time, and the best color you can land on is gold, but this is going to go to blue, and it landed on at a four-star recruit, so I'm seeing what Virginia could potentially need, which is definitely going to be tight end, so next season they're going to have a four-star tight end that signs with the school. That's probably one of the worst things that you can get, but we're just going to advance all the way up to week 10, and in that time frame, the Cavaliers went 1-4, and four, as the only team they were able to take down was winless Kent State. Meanwhile, the Hokies are sitting at 4-4, four and four, but they still have a slight chance at making the conference championship, and if they want to do so, they're going to have to win games in these next two weeks, but they drop one to Boston College, so both of these team seasons are pretty much over. They might make bowl games, but we're going to look at their commits, and the computer's not done a great job at recruiting so far. Both schools have only signed four players, while losing out on guys like Mike Stewart that would have been super helpful, but they are are competing for Adam Gilbert, and after scouting him, this kid's a 76 overall running back. I guess once we get to the end of the season, we'll see which of the two colleges get him. And going into the offseason, the Hokies have a 1,000 point lead on Virginia. As for how the year played out for both teams, Virginia finished down here at 5-7, and seven, while Virginia Tech was 6-6, six and six, which should make them bowl eligible. And the Hokies might have dropped six games, but five of them were to ranked opponents, so as of right now, they seem to have a slight edge over Virginia, who ended up going on a six-game losing streak in the middle of the year. Virginia is also going to lose their quarterback in Tony Musket, so it's a good thing that they have a sophomore running back named Xavier Brown, and their six best receivers on this roster are all going to return next season. I'd also like to point out that Virginia Tech had a tight end that had 11 touchdowns, so it's going to be interesting to see how he develops. Kyron Drones has one more year at quarterback, and when you take their senior running back off the roster, he was their leading rusher. As I scroll through the NCAA stat leaders, none of the top players are on either of these colleges, so neither college is completing any of these five challenges yet, but Virginia Tech did get a spot in the Holiday Bowl, and we'll see if they're able to finish over 500. That would be nice since they lost a game to Virginia already, and technically they're behind in this rebuild race, but there's truly no telling who's going to pull away as the better college first and Virginia Tech gets the win. We're only going to spectate the end of those matchups if they're actually close, and both of these schools seem to be losing quite a lot of good starters to graduation. The good news for both programs though is they didn't have any players enter the transfer portal, and Virginia Tech's not going to pick anybody up out of it, but Virginia does as they get a 66 overall right guard. Nothing too exciting has happened yet, but the computer has to decide how to split up these 10,000 thousand points for both colleges, and this signing day period of the offseason recruiting could be very interesting. It looks like the Hokies get a 76 overall tight end, while Virginia Tech gets a 68 overall left end, but I don't think either of these two classes are going to be very impressive. There's a 74 overall wide receiver, and you're going to see that Tanyard Roberts chose Ohio State while Adam Gilbert went to Kentucky. Virginia really wanted to land him, but they came up short, and that means that the rest of their recruiting class is looking incredibly weak. But remember, they do get to add one four-star recruit in a tight end to their roster, and depending 
on how player progression goes, they could improve there as well. I see the Cavaliers have a 90 overall at wide receiver with senior J.R. Wilson. And another shock is the quarterback they thought they were going to start dropped two overalls while this guy gained nine. So junior Delaney Crawford's now the future for them. As for the Hokies, most of their players seem to improve a good bit with a plus seven here. Kyron Drones only went up two though. And I'm starting to wonder if we should just start the sophomore Pop Watson the third, who is an 85. That would give Virginia Tech three years of a great quarterback. And in case you were wondering where their recruiting classes finished, Virginia Tech was at number 70 while Virginia was down here at 78. The four star tight end the Cavaliers got for beating the Hokies though looks very solid with Curtis Henderson being a 76. And from here on out in this rebuild, that rivalry matchup's gonna be the final game of every season. Now I am spectating quite a lot, but I'm also allowed to help by doing stuff like redshirting players. So I'll be doing that for both teams, giving players extra years of eligibility that could use it. And it's going to be interesting to see how the ACC shapes out because once again, Virginia's projected to be one of the worst teams, but they're an 83 overall while the Hokies are an 86. And Virginia Tech's future outlook could get them close to maybe getting a playoff bid three or four years from now, but the same could not be true for the Cavaliers as they're supposed to go a bit downhill. I could not tell you how the second season's going to go for either team, but we're going to advance to week nine. And Florida State must have really fallen off. They lost to Virginia, who right now is sitting at two and four, but all of those losses have came against ranked schools. And I can't believe I'm saying this right now, but Virginia Tech sitting at 7-0, number nine in the country with a win on the road at number 17 Clemson. Somehow their schedule ended up being a cakewalk. They're probably going to make the playoffs in year number two. And I decided to let Kyron Drone start instead of the sophomore where he's been doing very well. The Hokies have also picked up a lot of good recruits. So even though they lost out on Matthew Newton, they got Derek O'Donnell and it looks like he's going to be a beast on defense. The Cavaliers have also competed pretty well for some prospects so far as they got this 67 overall quarterback and this 77 overall corner. So they're moving forward as well, but their schedule is holding them back. Right now in the ACC, their division's a lot tougher and on the road at Miami, they're going to get blown out. So their year's pretty much done, but it'll be interesting to see if they could upset Virginia Tech and ruin their undefeated season. Well, it turns out someone else would do that first as Virginia Tech is coming off of a loss to Syracuse. And with their weak strength of schedule, they've actually dropped out of the playoffs. That's surprising to me, especially since Kyron Drones is up here in the Heisman race. But if they want to get in, they have to win the rivalry. And the Cavaliers are having another bad season, sitting here at 3-8 and eight with another six-game losing streak, but they could really change things up here. They've already been building out a much better recruiting class than I ever thought they'd land, getting defensive athletes like Trey Simpson that'll make a big difference. And it might seem like they're far behind in this rebuild, but they were able to win this matchup last season. So I see no reason why they couldn't go out and do it again. With about a minute left, it is just a six-point difference between these two rivals. And Virginia Tech's trying to hold on right now, but in order to do so, they have to stop junior quarterback Delaney Crawford, and he handed it off on third and long. Virginia has burnt through almost half the time they had remaining, just trying to pick up a first down here, and they're not even going to do that. So the Hokies are going to beat their rivals and probably make it to the playoffs, but these teams are clearly not as separated as it seems like they are. And Malachi Thomas just had a really good day. Kyron Drones also threw for four touchdowns, so now Virginia Tech is getting their first spin of this race where they are going to get three coach levels. That's kind of a big deal because right now Brent Pry's sitting at a level 14 and with a few more levels he's going to be much better than Tony Elliott is right now. But what's more important is Virginia Tech goes out and wins the ACC championship against Miami because if they don't there's a chance that they drop out of the 12 team playoffs. And Kyron Drones is still in the race to potentially win a Heisman Trophy. I did not think all this could happen so soon but it's a good thing I didn't start Pop Watts in the third and Virginia Tech could end this rebuild this season. They're probably not going to though because right now they're trailing by 15 points with about 30 seconds left in the ACC championship. And it just took their offense way too long to get it going. They got to get this two-pointer, but they didn't. So what happens with this onside kick really doesn't matter and Miami's going to take it home. Well, the Hokies aren't going to knock off winning an ACC championship yet, but depending how good of a season that Kyron Drones had, there's other challenges that could be up for grabs. And one day, one of the Virginia schools will get to lift this trophy. With three touchdowns and no picks, Kyron did not disappoint, but he'd only get 28 first place Heisman votes. And it looks like Virginia Tech has made the the playoffs. As for being a national award winner, he's going to fall short on multiple different ones, which is really a shame because he threw for almost 4,000 yards and 40 touchdowns, but that wasn't even enough to lead the country in passing yards. So I had to keep scrolling through some of these stats and there it is. There is a stat leader with tackles. Virginia Tech's Will Johnson has knocked off the first challenge of this video as he has the tiebreaker and the most solo tackles in the country. So of the five that these schools have to complete, the Hokies have already knocked off one. And let's not forget if they're able to go on a run, they could win a title. They're rushing 
rushing attack really wasn't that strong with Malachi Thomas leading the way, but receiving wise, they had a guy with 11 touchdowns again, and I don't even want to try to pronounce his name. Before they take on Auburn in their first round matchup though, we also have to check out Virginia's stats where their quarterback had 16 touchdowns to 12 picks. Delaney Crawford did not perform the way I thought he would, but they had a running back clear 1,000 rushing yards, and 5'9 Xavier Brown set up to have a great senior year. Their 90 overall receiver, J.R. Wilson, also put up some solid stats, but all those guys are just watching from the couch, as Virginia Tech was able to make the playoffs first. This all happened a lot sooner than I thought it would, and it looks like the Hokies are going to take a lead, so with two minutes left, they're going to go up by four, and this roster must be good if they've gone on the road and put up this much of a fight versus Auburn. I figured it was going to be five or six seasons minimum before one of these colleges sniffed a chance at the playoffs, but as of right now, it looks like the Hokies are going to be headed to the quarterfinals, and their defense just needs to step up. You can't be giving up catches like this to the Tigers. It should have been picked, but instead he was able to catch it, and with a minute and a half left, Auburn still has plenty of time to just score a touchdown. We'll see if the Tigers are able to pull it off, though. The halfback screen's going to get them like five or six, and on third and one, they hit them with a play action. They didn't hand the ball off there, so it is a new set of downs, and they are going to go deep against the defense. Holden Jaronair placed that one a little bit out of bounds as he was just off target, but he made up for it on the next play, and if you're a Virginia Tech fan, you've got to be nervous right now. There's still so much time left, and if they're not going to generate any pressure, the Tigers are going to take it inside the 10. So Auburn's just eight yards away from breaking the Hokies' heart, and they're getting even closer. I really don't know why they're spiking it, but if they just hand the ball off, they should score a touchdown. And after they had a kick return that wasted over 10 seconds, Virginia Tech is running the ball. They have to get in field goal range to send it to overtime, and their clock management has been terrible. So it seems like the 10 seed is not going to make it out of the first round, and this is probably going to be the final play of the game. It's not even a Hail Mary. Kyron Drones is going to do it with his legs, but he clearly couldn't reach the end zone. And the Auburn Tigers have knocked off the Hokies. I'd still consider this a successful season knocking off the first challenge, but they probably could have completed a couple more, and it just wasn't Kyron Drones' day. Somehow 12-seeded Boston College ended up winning it all, so the national champion literally came out of the ACC, and there's a school record. Kyron Drones is going to go down as a legend because he shattered everything here, and the Hokies are off to a much better start than what the Cavaliers have done, only getting eight wins in two seasons. With a lack of success, they're going to lose a freshman right tackle that would have started for them this year, and once again, there's a ton of players graduating they could really use, including J.R. Wilson, who's going on to the NFL. As for the Hokies, they almost lost Pop Watts in the third, even though he's never taken a collegiate snap. And I'm not sure how much transfers like this are really helping Virginia. It is cool to see a player go in the fifth round, the sixth round, and a seventh round between the two programs, though. And who knows how these coaches are going to split up their points on signing day. I see that Virginia Tech got a couple really good overalls, and they're putting themselves in a really good position to win this race. With those 17 prospects, they didn't sign a top 10 class, but they did come in at 21. And that's so much better than Virginia that got some decent guys, but they finished at number 56. I really don't know how the Cavaliers are going to come back from this, but maybe Trey Simpson's going to be a beast, and he's only a 72 halfback. I figured he'd just play there, but after looking at these DBs, I think I'm going to move him over to strong safety, because the Cavaliers have not recruited well there, so he's going to have to start for them. As for Virginia Tech, their current roster is nuts, because this is before player progression, but they also have an athlete to move around, and I think Derek O'Donnell is going to play center for them. Now it's time to see how much everybody improves, and honestly, I was expecting some bigger jumps from some of these Virginia Tech players. As for the Cavaliers, though, three of their top guys didn't even gain one overall, and it might be worth it to start sophomore David Franz just to see what he can do. He's a pocket passer, and as a sophomore, he has three years left here, and this might not seem like that big of a deal, but the Cavaliers did pick up a level 18 offensive coordinator, so that could make a huge difference in how well their offense performs. For comparison, even though Virginia Tech has a higher level head coach, their coordinators are lower levels, and that's about the only thing going in the Cavaliers' favor right now because their receiving room is about to stink. The future of Virginia Tech, on the other hand, looks amazing as they're going to have a redshirt freshman quarterback, and their conference outlook has them finishing first in their division in the ACC, while the Cavaliers are supposed to be at the bottom down here at number 8. This got very lopsided very quick. The Hokies are supposed to be back in the running for the playoffs in the future, while Virginia might never sniff it in this video. If David Franz doesn't pan out for them, they're in a ton of trouble, and an 81 overall roster is just not going to get it done. Virginia Tech's also dropped, though, going down to an 84. So as we sim through this first half of the season, we might find out that they're not as good as they were in the previous year. And by week 10, I was not expecting this, but the Hokies are sitting at 5-3 and three with losses to Cal, Stanford, and Louisville. It's not like Virginia is doing any better, though, as they're 2-5 and five without a conference win, so the Cavaliers better get it together soon. Because Virginia Tech's putting together some really good recruiting classes, as I see so many 73 pluses. In comparison, this is what the Cavaliers' recruiting class looks like. They're clearly the underdog. But this 6-6-4 star could be amazing. And let's just advance up to the most important.
important part of the year when they take on Virginia Tech. They'd pick up a win in that time frame, but what's more surprising to me is Virginia Tech has climbed up to number 18. And in the college football poll, they're sitting at number 16, so they could make the playoffs, and that would set them even further apart from Virginia. The only thing the Cavaliers have going for them is their home field advantage, and there's a lot of four stars on visits, so maybe they could turn things around, but they'd have to figure out a way to upset the Hokies. I gotta say, this is one of the oddest scores that I have ever seen Sim spit out in this game, but it's going to be a tight finish, and there's another record for the Hokies. With just 43 seconds left, they're trailing by five, but they have the ball, and I feel like they shouldn't even waste it down by spiking it, but Pop Watson the third still did, and it seems like he has a wide receiver open deep. That's going to be a tutty, and what a tight finish this has been in a rivalry matchup just like last season. Virginia desperately needs to come out on top, but they're going to take a sack, and now the odds of them getting into field goal range are very slim on this next play. They just had nobody open, so it's clear that the Hokies are going to get the right result versus them again, and if the wheel spin gets them anything good, they're going to be miles ahead of Virginia. This doesn't even feel like much of a race right now, because one college is clearly dominating it, but Virginia fans can still have hope, because Pop Watson the third could be gone after this year, and they just need the wheel spin to not give the Hokies anything too crazy. It's going to land on that, and Pop Watson the third is about to go up by even more overalls. With a plus five to all of these, he's now a 97, so if Virginia Tech makes the playoffs or convinces him to come back, they're so sad, but it's really hurting them that they're not going to be in this ACC Conference Championship game, and I had no idea that Pat Watson the second was second in the Heisman race. He'd win the Robert Maxwell Award, which completes a challenge, and once again, Virginia Tech has found a way to make it to the playoffs. What's crazy about what the junior quarterback did is he'd actually take home three awards, and now the Hokies have knocked off their second of five challenges in this rebuild. They had a really good rushing attack, with both of these guys having double-digit touchdowns on the ground, and if you thought what Xavier Turner Bradshaw did last season was insane, look at these numbers. He's currently averaging over 100 yards per game, and when you compare it to what the Virginia receivers did, it's not even close. Xavier Brown also left people a little bit disappointed, but if David Franz could just cut out the turnovers, he might be good in his final two seasons. It's kind of nuts that Brett Pry can already get instant commits, which is going to make it even harder for Virginia to compete, but I think the Hokies are going to be a first round exit, and if they're not, it's all because of their 97 overall quarterback. I should have kept a closer look at the Heisman race, but I really had no clue that he was performing that well, and he might actually carry this team on a deep playoff run. They're going to beat the Longhorns by 17, and that's because he threw for almost 400 yards and three touchdowns, while Traylon Mitchell rushed for over 100 and had these two. Now they're set to play West Virginia, and they actually took them down in their first game of the year, so I wouldn't be shocked if they did it again. So far, all we've really done is spectate Virginia Tech, so it's like the Cavaliers aren't even a part of this rebuild, and I think the Hokies are going to be fine again. Their defense played really well in this one. Holding West Virginia to just seven points, and with this halfback screen, it is going nowhere. The odds of the Mountaineers coming back now are so tiny, but it is still a possibility. And to keep that hope alive, they need to get this two-point conversion, which they do. Now they need the onside kick to go their way, and it's not going to. Virginia Tech is headed to the semifinals in this rebuild already. We are only in season three, and they've already had so much success. Their quarterback room's just been really solid, and they'll be facing either Notre Dame or Oklahoma next. The Irish are undefeated, so that would be a tough matchup, but they'd beat the Sooners even if they tried to make it look close at the end. So that's who the Hokies have next, and on paper, this is a huge mismatch. They're on like a seven-game winning streak, though, and it did matter versus Texas, so they could come out on top. But with just a few minutes left, the Hokies are down by 14, and Pop Watson the third's trying to help his team get back into it. It looks like he's about to get the ball back, so that will give him a chance to tie it up unless Notre Dame somehow picked this up, but instead it's an interception. And if the Hokies can't get a touchdown out of this, that would be so embarrassing, but they get the first. So they're set to tie this one all up at 35, and they're also taking a little bit of time off the clock in the process, but now they're going down. So that makes this a third and goal from like the seven yard line, and they're short. If the Irish step up here, they're headed to the championship, and that terrible play call is going to end Virginia Tech's season. Pop Watson the third didn't play that well, and the Irish were clearly good as they won the whole thing. Drones records literally only lasted a season, so they were very short-lived. And Xavier Turner Bradshaw's the best receiver in school history now, so I'm not shocked that Brent Pry just got a five-year extension, while Tony Elliott's job security is low, and he's so close to getting fired. He better turn around Virginia this season, and that's not going to be easy losing a high overall like Xavier Brown, and then also having a wide receiver hit the transfer portal. It's always the low overalls that would rarely see the field anyway, because Virginia Tech's going through the same thing. But they have much bigger losses that they're dealing with, as Pop Watson the third is gone to the NFL. And he might have only started for one year, but he's put the Hokies in a great position. Shortly after that, we'd end up on another signing day, and something happened that I would have never expected. Virginia Tech had a really good class, and it finished all the way up here at number 11. And overall-wise, it also looks a lot better than what the Cavaliers put together, but they 
did sign this 81 overall athlete in Elliott Steele. And with the quantity of having 24 players in their class, Virginia's finished at number 10 right above the Hokies. That means the Cavaliers completed that challenge before Virginia Tech could. And they're a one-star school with a very weak receiving room. But when you have four athletes that you can move around like 6'6 Corey Walker, you're going to end up being just fine. As for Elliott Steele, I wasn't sure what position he'd play, but it turns out he's also a receiver. And Mario Daniels could be the future of this program because he can play QB. Then you got Sean Wright at halfback with his 94 speed. And I don't know how it was so lopsided, but the Hokies didn't recruit a single athlete. They're actually not sitting as pretty as I thought they would be because they had multiple players not go up a single overall and even regress in some situations. Alongside freshman James Jenkins staying at a 76 while Marcus Brown's their new starter. As for Virginia, there's clearly a lot of improvements that still need to be made, but they have a quarterback room with a 71 overall freshman and an 85 overall junior. I also forgot about Mario Daniels, who we can redshirt, but compared to some of the freshmen that Virginia Tech has, it's going to be so hard for the Cavaliers to compete. I'm pretty sure Virginia just keeps getting worse because they've dropped to a 79 overall, but they're not supposed to be last in their division, and of course Virginia Tech is first in Coastal. Four years from now, they're literally supposed to be a top six team, but the Cavaliers have surprised me a little bit because after this season, they're supposed to potentially reach the top 25. Who knows how it'll all play out, but we'll just jump ahead to week nine when they go on the road at number seven, Miami. And going into this, I didn't think the Cavaliers would be favored. Somehow as a 91 overall, Miami's two and five, and this is the best start Virginia's ever gotten off to sitting at four and two, while Virginia Tech's all the way down here at three and four. I figured the Hokies would have had a tough schedule, but they've won their last two against ranked teams, and it's just going to get more difficult for Virginia as there's number seven and number four coming up. No matter what happens, Tony Elliott should keep his job though, and I didn't even notice the Cavaliers hired a level 26 defensive coordinator, which has made a big difference. When it comes to recruiting, they've also signed another 81 overall four-star athlete. This guy's from Virginia, and he's an amazing QB. The computer's losing out on a lot of battles, but at least they're targeting some higher overalls, and they have to do that since the Hokies continue to bring in a ton of good signings. It looks like they're also struggling with getting locked out of some of these prospects, though, and I guess we're ready to advance to week 14 whenever these two rivals are going to face off against each other. By then, it was clear that neither program was having a great season as both of them were sitting at 6-5, and five. and the Hokies are on a three-game winning streak, so they've got some momentum, but Virginia really needs to win this. It's their slight chance at potentially coming back in this rebuild, but it's on the road and they're not favored, so it's going to be hard for them to come out on top. The last two years, this has been such a good matchup, though, and that would also be the case this season as there's just a minute left where it's a one-possession game and Virginia just scored a touchdown, so Virginia Tech needs to respond back, but they're going to throw an interception to the Cavaliers, and I think they can just run out the rest of the clock. As long as they don't snap this ball too soon, they're going to be fine. Time has run out, and Virginia has taken down the Hokies. Forcing that turnover wins them a spin on the upgrade wheel, and they're actually making a bit of a comeback. Right now, Virginia Tech doesn't have a great option at QB with Marcus Brown, and we'll see what the wheel lands on. It's going to be plus 10 to every stat, and that can be applied to any player, but I think you got to go with the freshman QB. Going into this, Mario Daniels is just a 74 overall, but after getting a plus 10 to every stat, he is a 92, and that might be the most OP upgrade on the wheel. To be honest, you might as well just burn his red shirt because he's going to be gone in a few years no matter what. And David Franz definitely improved, cutting out on the turnovers and having a better completion percentage, but he's no longer going to be responsible for getting receivers like Elliott Steele the ball. Between freshman running back Sean Wright and Robert Mitchell, Virginia's rushing attack wasn't terrible either. And then when you look at the Hokie stats, Traylon Mitchell was just a yard short of a thousand. I'm sure he'll get that in the ball game. and Marcus Brown was 27 touchdowns to seven picks. So those are serviceable numbers, but these were receivers did not perform well. The Heisman winner actually went to a running back at Rice, and Virginia has San Diego State in the Las Vegas Bowl, while Virginia Tech has Fresno State in the Jimmy Kimmel Bowl. This is about where I expected the colleges to be at this point, finishing mid-table in their respective divisions, but we can't just act like Virginia Tech wasn't in the semifinals last year, and I can't believe they're not favored in this bowl. It's been really interesting to see how the computer rebuilds, and I'm starting to think that either team could still win this race. I mean, Virginia Tech is now struggling with the Bulldogs, but after they settled for three there, all the Hokies need is one first down to seal their win. And I think this is a pivotal point in this rebuild because they've always been above 500. Losing to Fresno State would change that and on third and five they don't get it out. So they had to punt it back and the Bulldogs have driven down the field in like five plays. They're about to reach the end zone. I don't know what their defense has been doing but they're giving up so many yards. And this is actually the fifth play of the drive which results in a touchdown. We've already seen Marcus Brown struggle to lead a game winning drive whenever they took on Virginia this year. So who knows if he's going to come up clutch for them and that just got out. It really hurts the Hokies that their freshman quarterback didn't progress at all during the offseason because that's why they have the junior out there in the first place.
face, but he's going for the deep shot and it is going to be reeled in. Wes Blankenship just clutched up and if they could find a way to reach the end zone in the next 30 seconds, that would be massive for Virginia Tech. That's going to be two stiff arms and there's just something about this Hokie team that always finds a way to survive. I mean, they haven't done it yet, but you can tell that they're about to reach the end zone as long as this is a smart pass and Marcus Brown just made sure they stayed above 500. I guess he wanted to lock in that he'd be the starter going into his senior year and now it's time for Virginia's first bowl game in this rebuild where they are favored even though they have a worse record than San Diego State. It's time for the freshman QB to have his debut and I'm assuming he'll play well, but something's gone wrong with the shaders in this stadium. It's supposed to be inside Allegiant Stadium, but it's not, so that's why it's so bright. How did he just make that throw? And I'm not showing as many plays because it's an eyesore to look at, but that was still an incredible one. It's given San Diego State a chance down by six. This is a fourth and two that they draw, and that means Virginia is going to take the Las Vegas Bowl trophy. Their best player was Kyle Ferris, a defensive one, so that means Mario Daniels didn't do enough, but it was still a decent debut. I thought Virginia might never turn this around, but for the first time in four years, they had a better season than Virginia Tech, and David Franz had the right idea testing the waters for the NFL, but he decided to stay for no reason. He's not going to start, but the Hokies were able to get their 90 overall left tackle to come back for a senior year, and that's big, but then they lost out on this 73 overall freshman right outside linebacker. The transfer portal made up for it, though, as their first transfer is an 82 overall freshman wide receiver from Florida, and at the same time, Virginia got nothing. The Cavaliers are so unlucky, as even an 84 overall at Virginia Tech gets drafted, and it's time to see how these recruiting classes panned out. It looks like the Hokies have regressed, and they technically did, finishing at number 13, which is still outside of the top 10. After knocking off that challenge last season, Virginia probably won't come close to touching it again, but they did get Jimmy Ross. So that is the one bright spot in the 73rd best class in the country, and we all know that he would have made for a great QB, but they could use the help at wide receiver. Now, Virginia Tech did lose their best running back this season, so they need somebody new to step up, and I think a great option would be moving freshman Matt Lane over there as he's a 76. Even with the down year that they had, their roster's looking pretty solid, and these training results went pretty well as Marcus Brown is up to an 89 overall. However, after he graduates, they don't have a great option at QB because James Jenkins went down by two, and over at Virginia, they have two 94-plus QBs to choose between. Going into Season 5, both Virginia schools are projected to finish mid-table in their respective divisions, and these rankings actually put them together pretty close at 30 and 35, with Virginia having a lead in the future. This race is just starting to heat up because either college could come out on top. And with this many points in recruiting, I would expect Brent Pry to put together a top 10 class, but he still hasn't been able to, and these are the prospects that he's decided he wants to go after. Like always, we're just going to advance to around mid-season in week 9 and then check in on how both these colleges are doing. And I'm seeing a lot of yellow names on the Hokies recruiting board. They've signed so many different players, including a 75 overall quarterback that could be their future. And it looks like right now the Cavaliers have two losses, while Virginia Tech also has two. They lost back-to-back -back ones at Stanford and against Florida State, while Virginia lost on the road at Notre Dame and then on the road at Pitt. Marcus Brown and Mario Daniels are also second and sixth in passing yards, so it'll be interesting to see how the rest of the year finishes out. Victor West decided he wanted to come here, and I'm assuming he's probably going to play defense for Virginia, but they did lose out on athlete Andy Adams. I think if either program wants to make it to the playoffs this year, they're going to have to go undefeated over this five-game stretch, but I didn't think Virginia would actually pull that off, because every one of these matchups was super tight, and they've locked their spot into the ACC Conference Championship, while Virginia Tech might also make it there. With one more loss than Virginia, the Hokies aren't ranked like the Cavaliers are, and neither team has anybody in the Heisman race, so I think we've covered everything that we need to before the Commonwealth Cup, and this is a huge opportunity for Virginia. This is their chance to come back in the rebuild, and they might even be able to take a lead in this race, but that's all dependent on who comes out on top, and I swear, we see the weirdest score combos. Right now, it's really not looking good for the Cavaliers, because with 40 seconds left, they find themselves trailing by three points, and they have to pick up this fourth and 12 or the game's over, but they just checked it down. Mario Daniels couldn't get the win for his team, and both programs have made it to the ACC Championship. That's going to be a very pivotal moment, so Virginia Tech needs something good with this wheel spin, and they're adding on a four-star. With a class like this and some of the past ones that they've had, that's really not going to make much of a difference for them, but it could help fill a need since they do need some more defensive tackles, and both programs are sitting at 9-3 and three going into the ACC Championship. What's interesting about this is the winner of the game could end up making it into the college football playoffs, but the rankings are all over the place, as in the coaches poll, Virginia Tech's down at 22, and Marcus Brown has appeared in the running for the Heisman race. He's actually leading the country in passing yards right now, and both of these teams have improved throughout the year. Whoever wins this knocks off a challenge, though, and they also get a spin on the upgrade wheel, so the stakes are very high with two minutes left.
left. And once again, Virginia finds themselves trailing to the Hokies. I don't know why, but they just can't seem to beat them. I mean, Mario Daniels does have two minutes to score a touchdown, which is honestly plenty of time, but he still has to make it happen. And these short checkdowns might not do it. It's quickly become third and four, and he is going to take the drag to get the first. But the Cavaliers still need about another 50 yards. And that was such a great juke move. Robert Mitchell is setting up his team nicely. And now Mario Daniels wants to run, but the Hokies were prepared for it. They watched film on him and he's going to try to do the same thing again. He's also stiff armed a player, but that's what happens when you get to boost every single stat by plus 10. And that was almost picked. This ACC championship is really coming down to the wire. He can't make it out. And now it is third and eight where Mario Daniels goes to the flat and they're all over it. Virginia is in a lot of trouble because time is ticking. Just 15 seconds left on the clock. Now they are short and the Hokies keep on pulling off incredible things. Those back-to-back -back wins over Virginia are massive because it gives them a huge advantage in this race. And Marcus Brown actually ended up filling in perfectly as a great QB. Now the Hokies get another boost and we will see what the wheel takes us to. It's going to be add one five star. So they're also getting like an 80 overall recruit this offseason and Brown almost won the Heisman. Mario Daniels would win the Davey O'Brien award though. So his 4,000 passing yards did just enough for his team, completing a second challenge for Virginia, but the Hokies have now knocked off three. I've also noticed that Mario Daniels might be Virginia's leading rusher with almost a thousand yards. So even though he didn't have the most passing ones for a QB, I had to see if he had the most rushing and he didn't because of these two quarterbacks at Missouri and Coastal. To wrap up the season stats, Jimmy Ross was solid as a freshman and then Elliott Steele was great for a sophomore. But those don't compare to the numbers that Virginia Tech had in their receiving room with Oliver Henry going off. Keep in mind, this kid is only a sophomore and they're also going to be able to use transfer Corey Wade next season, but they won't have Marcus Brown slinging the rock. And convert wide receiver to halfback Matt Lane put up some really good numbers. As for making the playoffs, Virginia Tech would fall just short, and they'd be matched up with number 17 Auburn. They're actually ranked higher than the Hokies in the coaches poll though, so there's been a lot of variance in the different rankings, and the coaches poll got it right with Auburn being the better team clearly. They'd win by 17, and I don't know what happened to Marcus Brown, but he just crumbled. I'm sure Virginia Tech fans can forgive him though, because he's the reason Virginia's season fell apart, and they're looking to get a bowl win over Cincinnati. Because of how bad the Cavaliers won, David France would get to play at quarterback again, and there's still one more season for Mario Daniels to go off before he makes it to the NFL. He's already taken away Bryce Perkins' record, and also quarterback Matt Schaub's, while Steele might as well just be the best wide receiver in school history. Right now, it looks like Virginia is set to make the playoffs going into next season, and both coaches just got contract extensions. As we go over to the players leaving tab, you're going to see that there's a lot of Hokies that are gone, and that includes junior tight end Isaiah Hadley. Virginia is also losing their tight end, but it's to graduation, and David France is declaring, but he's He's going to have to hope a team picks him up based off of his previous two years. And somebody did in the first round while Marcus Brown went in the fourth. Virginia Tech had no crazy transfer request this year, but it looks like Virginia did pick up a left end. And 75 overall athlete Victor West is the best player that committed to them this year, but it looks like they did lose out on Sean Bryant to Virginia Tech. The Cavaliers finished with the 21st best class in the country. But what I'm really curious about is where this one finished because they signed 24 prospects and it's got to be in the top 10. Well, 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 Virginia Tech has knocked off their fourth challenge in this video. And the only thing left for them to complete is winning a national championship. Because James Jenkins hasn't improved that much though, it's going to be hard. And if any school signed a lot of athletes, it's been Virginia with this guy becoming a 76 overall quarterback. This has been their specialty and probably the only thing keeping them in this rebuild. But what would really help them is if player progression went well. And obviously there's not much for Mario Daniels to improve upon, but some of these other players jumped up a bunch. This might be the first season where the Hokies roster is worse and their transfer core Corey Wade lost three overalls, but Matt Williams at quarterback went up by nine and then James Jenkins finally improved. That will be enough to get him the starting job for two seasons. And in the meantime, we're going to redshirt Roy Fernando. Virginia also is a freshman quarterback. They're going to sit for a year in Rashawn Fritz. And the level of freshmen that are being redshirted keeps getting better. Things are about to get interesting too, because Virginia is supposed to finish second in their division while Virginia Tech's supposed to do the same. And right now, Mario Daniels is the favorite to win the Heisman. So both of these teams might make it to the playoffs and they're both starting in the top 20. This is the highest overall Virginia's ever been, and Virginia Tech's not far behind at an 84. What we'll do from here is simulate to week 9 because that's what we've done in all of the other seasons, and it looks like Virginia's tied for first place with North Carolina while in the other division, Virginia Tech is down at second with two losses. It's going to be hard for them to make the conference championship, and they picked up a third loss at Iowa, but they've had a much harder schedule than the Cavaliers who've only faced one ranked team, and Mario Daniels is surprisingly not in first for the Heisman. He is leading the country in passing yards, which is something to keep an eye on, but so much could still change at any moment, and I want to advance up to week 13 because
because it's a big one. Number four, Syracuse is on the schedule for the Hokies, and beating them would still give them a slight chance at making the ACC championship, which would be against Virginia. The Cavaliers have gone on a tear, still not losing a game, but they're facing North Carolina. So that's why I wanted to stop here in week 13, because these two results could be absolutely huge for how the year plays out. Virginia is going to get the win over the Tar Heels, and Virginia Tech is going to beat number four, Syracuse. That result landed the Hokies some commits like Antonio Arnold and Damian Parrish, which they really needed, because athletes like him can play on both defense and offense. And in comparison to the Cavaliers class, I think Virginia Tech is doing a little bit worse. It's starting to look like Virginia could actually win this race because of Virginia Tech's four losses, but they're ranked 19th, and if they just beat LSU, they'd probably be in a playoff spot. With a couple weeks left in the Heisman Trophy race, Mario Daniels is back up to one, and I don't think anybody's catching him in passing yards, but he still has to take care of business versus the Hokies, and he's never beaten them before. It looks like they're going to have two five stars visiting. So just like last season, this is a crucial matchup, and of course it's going to be in a packed out stadium. I don't know what it is about taking down the Hokies, but Mario Daniels just can't do it. With 52 seconds left, his team is losing by four, and he isn't getting the ball out, so I think he's eventually going to take a sack. This has been the longest play I've seen in a while, and the refs are going to call a flag on Virginia. Offensive pass interference is not what you want to see there. I don't know why they'd hand it off, and I cannot believe that they're about to lose to Virginia Tech again. He's going to step up and sling it deep. This could be a play that turns things around, but his receiver wasn't even close to that ball, and this time he's looking back in the same direction. It's going to be picked off, though, and that's it. Virginia Tech has beaten Mario Daniels again, and this rivalry matchups made this race even better. The Commonwealth Cup literally belongs to Virginia Tech at this rate, and James Jenkins is starting to figure things out. With his stat line, he outperformed Mario Daniels, who turned it over twice, and the four and five stars that Virginia Tech got from this wheel last year haven't really affected them, but this plus five on all defensive stats will, and I think we should put it on their sophomore strong safety. Believe it or not, that's going to bring his overall all the way up to 91, and if you were wondering who the five-star recruit they got was, it was this left end, Sean Bryant, while the four-star was the 6'6 right guard, Danny Daly. Those are all the recent benefits of Virginia Tech beating Virginia, and they're up to number 13, but more importantly, they actually made the ACC championship versus the Cavaliers because Syracuse lost. That is right, Louisville was somehow able to take them down by three, and once again, these two colleges have to play in the ACC championship. The Cavaliers' offense is going to be hard to stop, but the last time the Hokies faced them, they held it down, and they have to win if they want to make it to the playoffs. As for Virginia, I'm pretty sure they'd make it either way, and after seeing that touchdown in the third quarter, I assumed it would be over, but it's not. Virginia Tech's made a comeback. As long as the Hokies reach the end zone, it's going to be back to being a one-possession game, and Matt Lane was able to take it in. He's the guy Virginia Tech converted from wide receiver to running back. The onside kick is recovered by Virginia, though, so it's a good thing that Virginia Tech still has all three of their timeouts left, but Mario Daniels is very quick. He's a 99 in pretty much every stat, and after keeping it the last time, he's going to give it to Sean Wright, who's pretty much going to seal it. All they need is another inch to move the chains, and he has it. That is going to be game. Virginia finally wins, and this is really going to shake up the race. I figured it was going to be super hard for them to come back, but after Mario Daniels threw for 336 yards, he helped his team take home an ACC championship, alongside also leading the country in passing yards by a large margin, which means he's knocked off two more challenges for Virginia, and whoever wins this race is all going to come down to who wins a championship first. There's a shot that could be this year with Mario Daniels also taking the Heisman, and the Hokies completely fell out of the top 25. To be honest, the junior stats from last season were a little bit better, especially on the ground as he rushed for less yards, but through the air, he was much more comfortable feeding sophomore Jimmy Ross and junior Elliott Steele. Steele actually led the country in receiving yards as well, and before I forget about it, I've got to spin the wheel because Virginia beat Virginia Tech, and that customized schedule one is huge because it means next season, Virginia gets to pick their non-conference opponents. Even though James Jenkins was relatively solid, I would be very nervous if I was a Virginia Tech fan right now, because things have swung in the Cavaliers' favor, and Oliver O'Henry regressed by almost half the amount of yards. Virginia is also set up pretty nicely to have a chance at winning it all this season, because they get a bye in the first round of the playoffs, and whoever wins this game is who they're going to face. It seems like it's going to be Texas A&M, because Oregon State's trailing by 7 with 20 seconds left, but that pass gets them to about midfield, and you got to spike it. It shouldn't surprise anybody that the Beavers have not had good clock management up until this point, but they've started to put together some good plays, and this is not the situation to take a check down. They weren't even able to get another snap off, so Texas A&M gets the win, but it was definitely a close call. It's time for the Cavaliers' first playoff appearance, though, and both of these teams are 90 overalls. That means we should get a close finish, and to nobody's surprise, it has been an offensive shootout. Neither defense has been able to get many stops, but if Virginia wants the win, they're going to need to do it if they get into the end zone here, and if the computer was smart, they'd be chewing clock here and then kicking a field goal. Instead, they're going to leave plenty of time on the clock, and Mario Daniels is trying to do it himself, but what is he doing? After he somehow evaded this defender, he could have gone into the end zone, but he turned around, and
and that means Texas A&M can win with a field goal. Like I said earlier, neither defense has performed well, but Virginia is going to have to figure it out. They're already giving up like 15 or 20 rushing yards, and this is one of their best shots to win a championship, but they could just be second round exits. For whatever reason though, the Aggies are not snapping the ball, and they're a bit out of field goal range, so they need this next play to go well for them, and that is another scramble. They clearly don't have faith in their kicker to hit it from here, so they're going to attempt the Hail Mary instead, and that is a fumble that's been forced. But Texas A&M's lineman picked it up, so the Aggies have one final chance to just chuck this ball up, and that did not go far. I can see why their quarterback was running so much now, and Virginia's headed to the semifinals. Mario Daniels proved why he deserved to win the Heisman, and his next opponent is either Ohio State or Iowa. The Buckeyes have had a good year with only one loss, so I figured they'd cruise to an easy win, but I was about to tie it up if they're in field goal range, and this game will be headed to overtime if the kick is far enough, but that was a super close call. I mean, it barely just went in, but that's all that they needed, and Ohio State has the first possession. The Buckeyes are 10 overalls better than the Hawkeyes, so how this ends is very important, and on third and six, Ohio State moved the chains. That gets them a fresh set of downs where their quarterback's gonna get them another six or seven yards, and they only need a little bit more to reach the end zone, but they're gonna fall short, making it a third and five where they are going to have somebody open. If you want Virginia Tech to win this race, you need Iowa to blow this, and they are in Wildcat with their running back throwing the football straight to the Buckeyes. I do not understand why they went with that on second down, their quarterback gets nothing, and Cedric Miller's season's gonna end if he cannot figure it out for them. The halfback screen was also read perfectly, so you can see why the Buckeyes are a two seed, and they're one play away from closing this out in overtime, that's going to be knocked down. So Virginia has to face a much tougher opponent. 14-0 Texas is also still left in the playoffs. So Virginia's path to winning it all is very difficult, but they have the Heisman winner on their team, and I really don't think they're going to get a better opportunity than this. With a minute and 23 seconds left though, they find themselves trailing by four points, and the Buckeyes defense has been locked down. It's really not looking great for the Cavaliers unless they can start to get things going again, and they do. But Mario Daniels still needs to get his team like another 54 yards, and he finds a receiver that's going to break a couple of tackles. There really are a lot of talented guys on this roster, but they're probably all going to leave after this season. He's using his 99 speed to perfection, and that puts Virginia inside the Buckeyes red zone, but he's going to take a sack. Then they're going to spike the ball, which wasted down, and the pressure is on. Mario Daniels, with the ball in his hands, is going to go to the end zone, and it is almost picked, but it wasn't, so he's got one more chance here, and with that hitch, it's just not enough. Ohio State's going to knock out Virginia in the semifinals, and that's got to be Mario Daniels' final game at Virginia. The Buckeyes wouldn't even win the entire thing, and after all of that, I can't forget about Virginia Tech's bowl game. They're playing BYU, which shouldn't be that difficult, but they're technically ranked higher than them, and all they have to do is defend their lead for the next 40 seconds. They're going to get the interception on this first play, so they're going to take the cheese at bowl, and I got to give credit to James Jenkins once again. Now, obviously, there were even more records set this season, but I didn't want to click through all seven of them, so you can see it here as Mario Daniels put three more in the record book, and then Elliott Steele had four. Virginia did so well that they got a new offensive coordinator that is a level 27, and that means that all of these skill trees are going to be maxed out just like their defensive coordinator. As for Virginia Tech, if we look over here, they're still not working with the best, so that's been a huge difference, and surely Mario Daniels declares. Both him and Elliott Steele are gone to the NFL, and then Rashawn Fritz is transferring out, so this is not good news for the Cavaliers, who are losing a bulk majority of their roster, and the guy that was supposed to be the future quarterback just doesn't want to stay. As for the Hokies, they're not losing as much talent because both James Jenkins and Corey Wade are returning, but there's a lot of depth pieces that are leaving this roster, as you can see, and the one transfer between the two schools is going to Virginia. It was only a matter of time before all these schools started putting a lot more players onto the NFL, but after losing all that talent, you have to rebuild somehow, and I'm pretty impressed by this board. Virginia wouldn't sign a great class, but it was inside the top 25, just like the Hokies, and there's a reason that they were so close together because it's hard to tell much of a difference between the two. The one athlete that Virginia Tech finally got is Damian Parrish, and I think he's going to play halfback. But then I saw how many corners they had on this roster, and I have no choice but to move the four-star over there instead. As for the athlete that Virginia got, I think he's best suited as either an offensive lineman or a defensive lineman, and we're going to put him at defensive tackle. It would have been much better if he could play quarterback since this is what the room looks like now, though. And if Shane Walker doesn't have a good offseason, the Cavaliers are in trouble. Well, they don't have to worry because he went up by 8 to a 91. And on the other side of things, two of Virginia Tech's top five players are quarterbacks. So it's going to be very interesting to see who wins this rebuild race. And remember, because of their wheel spin, Virginia gets to customize their schedule. So all three of the Cavaliers non-conference games this season are against FCS schools. As an 88 overall team, they could make a championship run again because they're supposed to be really good. And compared to the overalls of some of these other schools, they're in the same range. We could also see a Commonwealth Cup rematch in the ACC championship because Virginia Tech starting the season ranked 19th. And that's 
because James Jenkins has returned, who's in the Heisman running. Both of these schools are set to have good seasons, and it looks like Virginia is not even playing a good one until week seven. So I figured that they'd have a pretty good record, but I didn't think Virginia Tech would as well. And the Hokies got a really good win over number nine Florida State, winning by 36. Neither of these schools have anybody in the Heisman race, though, so I don't know what's carried both of the Virginia programs into the top five. And by the next time I'm checking in with these schools, it's going to be week 13 whenever they're both playing ranked opponents. Well, at least Virginia will be who's ranked number one now, and that's because their run has continued for even longer, but that's not true for Virginia Tech, who has dropped a game. They didn't lose by much, but Louisville beat them by one point, but that's not going to make a difference on who plays in the ACC championship, because no matter what happens this week, the Virginia schools are locked in. We could actually see both of them in the playoffs, which would be very entertaining. Virginia just destroyed North Carolina, and at Syracuse, the Hokies won by a ton. Those results mean this rivalry game is going to be between the number one and number six team in the country, and Virginia Tech's been putting together a very good class, recruiting two quarterbacks, and then a lot of 76 pluses. They did lose tackle Steve Everett to Virginia, though, but their class still looks better than what the Cavaliers have put together, as they just lost out on this receiver to Texas. It's time to see who wins the Commonwealth Cup, though, and Virginia has the number one offense in the country. Even though they lost their Heisman winning quarterback, they had absolutely zero issues finding his replacement, and he's done well so far with his team having a three-point lead with two minutes left, but so has James Jenkins, who's thrown for four touchdowns, and Virginia Tech does not pick up this third and nine. As we watch this kick, you're gonna see that it's all tied up at 31, and the pressure is on Shane Walker to step up here. This first play goes for nothing, but they still have a minute left to get in field goal range, and that's dropped. Now it is third and 11, and the halfback screen for the second time in three plays actually paid off on this one. The running back has broken free and he might be gone to the house. I cannot believe it worked, but we have finally seen one do well. With that play, Shane Walker's also going to set a school record, and Virginia's running back, Sean White, pretty much just sealed this rivalry matchup. It would take a miracle for the Hokies to come back with only 24 seconds left, and they still have quite a ways to go if they want to have a shot at throwing up a Hail Mary, but I don't think they're going to make it there, because they only have the time to run two more plays, and on this first one, it's going to be intercepted. The Cavaliers have beaten the Hokies, and that is the result they were looking for. This might even be returned for a pick six. It is always such a good finish between these two teams, and they're going to be playing again in the ACC championship, so we'll see if Shane Walker can replicate his record-breaking day, but I have a feeling that's going to be difficult, and the wheel is going to land on plus 10 to defensive stats. That can only go on one player, and after looking through their defensive line, they could definitely use it, so we're going to take Wesley Tyree, who transferred two years ago, all the way up to a 99, which makes me feel like that wheel upgrade is way too OP. Virginia's definitely gotten the better ones in this race, and and the Hokies only fell down by one spot, so even if they don't go out and win the ACC championship, they could still make the playoffs. I should also mention that Shane Walker is up to number one in the Heisman race, and when you see his season stats after this game, you're going to be shocked, but I have to point out that Virginia Tech is favored to win. I don't know why they would be, especially since the Cavaliers just added a 99 overall rusher, but Vegas probably knows something that we don't, and let's see who takes the rivalry this time. Well, this is a pretty big fourth and seven with a few minutes left, and Virginia is not going to pick it up. Instead, it's an interception that's going to be taken to the 30. So Shane Walker just turned it over when he shouldn't have. And Virginia Tech could actually win this game just like Vegas predicted. They would take a sack on the next play though, making this a third and 15. So the odds of picking it up are not great, but somehow the refs gave it to them there and they have started to chew the clock, trying to run out the rest of it. I've been very impressed at how almost every game these two teams play is so close. And I can't believe that receiver stepped out of bounds, making this a third and 10 that Virginia Tech is going to get. Now the Cavaliers are in some trouble because they have to start using timeouts, and they've not done a great job at running the ball so far, but this one's going to go for like 15. There's nothing that Virginia can do now, and the Hokies have won the ACC championship, which could really mess up the polls for both of these programs. Corey Wade had himself a day, and I don't know what the seedings are going to look like for the playoffs, but what I do know is Shane Walker would still win the Heisman, because he threw for over 5,000 yards, and if it weren't for his three interceptions in the ACC championship, he would have only thrown three all year. He was not a runner though, so that's why he had to lean on Sean Wright, and I have never seen wide receivers receivers put up stats like this before, but Jimmy Ross had 141 receptions for over 2,000 yards and 23 touchdowns. Obviously, he won the Bolitnikoff, but this is insane for Sam, and it makes Corey Wade's season for Virginia Tech not as impressive, but these stats are also really good. He was able to put up numbers like that because of James Jenkins, and Jenkins' rushing ability goes unnoticed because he had over 700 yards while their starter had over 1,000. What really matters, though, is the playoff seeding, and both of these colleges have first-round buys, so they got exactly what they were hoping for 
especially being on opposite sides of the bracket. This has actually been really interesting to follow as a rebuild, and there's a decent chance that the race comes to an end this season, but it'll all depend how the playoffs play out, and I'm not sure how Utah got ranked in the top five as a 74 overall team. They clearly couldn't perform, so Virginia has to play Iowa in the quarterfinals, and Virginia Tech will be playing the winner of this game, which is surprisingly close. It also just hit me that I forgot to spin the wheel for the Hokies for beating Virginia in the ACC championship, so after this, they're gonna get a level 15 defensive coordinator, and I don't even know if it'll help them. I think that's what they already have, but Air Force is going to almost pick up this third and 11, and I'm surprised that the refs gave it to them. They're also gonna float this one straight to Georgia, and with that interception, the Bulldogs are moving on to the quarterfinals against the Hokies. I'm not sure why that was even a contest, but that's just how things worked out, and here we go. It turns out Virginia Tech's defensive coordinator is only level 13, so I had to boost him a couple of levels, and this could help them out. They're still gonna struggle against a better Georgia team, especially since the Bulldogs have the number one defense, but we've also learned that overall doesn't mean everything, and we'll see how this sim plays out. This is definitely the most points that I've ever seen two teams combine for on five-minute quarter sims, but it's just been a shootout where neither defense seems to be able to get many stops. The Bulldogs are obviously losing, but they also have the ball around midfield, and all it would take would be a touchdown to put them onto the next round, but this isn't going to get them far. It is now third and nine, and they are going to take another check down, but somehow he got the first, and the Hokies defense is trying to do their best to just hold on here, but the Bulldogs are applying pressure. There is no telling if the Hokies are going to be able to make a run or if it's going to stop before they had a chance to even start it. But they took down Virginia in their last game, who was a really good opponent, so I'd assume that they could still win this. After wrapping up with that tackle, there is one final play for Georgia to reach the end zone, but Kyle Brooks just fell over, and with time running out, Virginia Tech is moving on. It really seems like this is going to be the final season of the rebuild, and for the Hokies to make it to the championship, they're going to have to beat the winner of this game. It wasn't even close, with the Buckeyes winning by a ton, and the reigning runner-ups are going to be a tough out. Now we're headed over to the other side of the bracket, though, where there's no guarantee that Virginia makes it to the semifinals. This Iowa team was already really good last season, but Virginia's had a two-possession lead throughout this entire matchup, and that could have sealed the game. Shane Walker put it perfectly on the money, but because it was dropped, the Hawkeyes still have a chance, and they've worked it all the way down the field in less than a minute where they're closing in on reaching the end zone. Now they'd still need to recover an onside kick as well, and then have a Hail Mary go in their favor, so a lot needs to go right here, but you never know what could happen, and with eight seconds remaining, the Hawkeyes are going to score. Now we'll see if they can recover this onside kick. That was actually really good, and it's rare that the computer pulls it off, but that's what I was saying. The game is not over until this play, and they're going to not get the ball out on the Hail Mary. Virginia is going to survive, and Sean Wright won player of the game, but I don't know why, because the Heisman winner had a pretty good performance as well. The last quarterfinal matchups between these two teams, and Texas A&M's a one seed after losing to Virginia in the playoffs last year. They clearly have their eyes set on getting revenge, beating the Tigers by 31 points, and these are some difficult semifinal matchups for the Virginia schools. There's a chance that neither of them makes it to the championship, but we'll just have to see how it unfolds, and the Cavaliers' pass-heavy offense is going to have to figure it out in the rain. Well, with a few minutes left, it looks like they are going to get the win, but Texas A&M is in a position to get it back within a possession, and all of a sudden, Virginia is going to have to work to run three minutes off of the clock. Stopping them on the two-point conversion does help, but Shane Walker still has to make sure that they don't give the ball back to them, and on second and five after running down some clock, they're going to make it a third and manageable. This is such a huge play for the Cavaliers, and they're passing instead of running. They were more comfortable with Shane Walker taking the sack, and that puts a lot of pressure on the defense to stop the Aggies' offense, who's already getting like 10 yards on them. I don't know why they'd be spiking it, though, on second and inches. And now on third down, they're going to keep it with the read option to move the chains. There's a decent chance that this is where we see the Cavaliers' run end. But after taking a little sack and then spiking it, it's third and 12 where they go deep, and that is not good. They just gave up a huge touchdown. Then on the two-point conversion, they're going to also pick it up. So Virginia is crumbling right now. This is not when they should be, but they still have. And we've seen what their kicker can do in some of the other sims during this season, which means this drive is pretty much touchdown or bust because he can probably only hit it from like 30 yards out. That's a deep throw and it's caught. But that's what you get with Jimmy Ross, the best wide receiver in the country. And there's still 50 seconds left, so that's exactly what they needed. Sean Wright's going to get them like seven. And then the dumb computer logic's going to spike the ball. Whether you've been rooting for Virginia or Virginia Tech in this video, you have to admit the race has been entertaining. And Virginia is so close to scoring a touchdown and ending this game, not sending it to overtime, but they have more to go. I'd say they're probably in field goal range by now, which is good, but I'm sure they'd also love to just end the game right now. And on third and seven, that's another first. The computer's deciding to get another playoff as well. They've put a guy into motion. This is the final play of the game and they didn't even get it off. The Cavaliers run is going to end like that. And I'm speechless. They should have at least sent it to overtime. Looking at this overall difference, we could be doing an 
another season. And if we're not going to be, Virginia Tech has to play well. But this is the same Ohio State roster that knocked out Virginia last year. That's why I'm a little surprised that approaching halftime, the Hokies have a 20-0 lead on the Buckeyes. And if they're able to drill this field goal, it's going to be 23-0. This is the worst Ohio State's played all season, and they never figured things out in the second half, so Virginia Tech is headed to the championship against Texas A&M. I did not think that game was going to go like that, but clearly James Jenkins is really good, and it would have been so cool if Virginia could have made the championship as well. Them choking there then could cost them the entire race, and Virginia Tech's coming off of a huge win, so we'll see if that momentum can carry them to winning a title. Just like Virginia, the Hokies have a lead over Texas A&M with a bit of time left, so we'll see how this one unfolds. The Aggies go backwards, and an early third and eight puts a lot of pressure on them. I'm assuming they're going to run a flood concept, and taking that flat didn't work. That's a big stop, because instead of doing the smart thing, going for it on fourth and two, the computer does the dumb thing, and Virginia Tech is going to get the ball back with two minutes left. To be fair, they have played a little better, but I would have never expected them to actually win a championship this year, and they're literally so close. All they have to do is pick up a first down, which they did right there. I gotta say, this rebuild concept where the teams are racing is a very entertaining one, and I enjoyed watching two rivals battle it out. I think it's pretty much all over, but the Hokies do need one more yard here, and they're not gonna get it. Could you imagine if they blew it in this final 15 seconds, and don't check how much time's left on the video, because that's gonna spoil if the Virginia Tech defense chokes. Here we go, 12 seconds left on the clock. The Texas A&M offense takes a sack, and there's no way everybody's getting back to the line. Virginia Tech has actually won the entire thing, as they were the first program to complete all five of these challenges, and I want to do this with other rival schools in the future if you all enjoy it, so make sure to smash the like button on this video, and at the end of the day, even though his development took a while, James Jenkins won it all. Before the video ends, I do want to recap some stats, mainly because we saw some incredible numbers in this rebuild, and over the course of seven seasons, Brent Pry was able to go 69-30. and 30. As for Tony Elliott, it wasn't as pretty, but he finished strong, and those two coaches' quarterbacks led the nation in passing yards, while the best two receivers also belonged to those schools. The only NCAA record set in this video was from Virginia's Jimmy Ross, but school-wise, when it comes to passing and receiving, both colleges had a lot of success, and in the Virginia Tech record book, you're going to see three different quarterbacks from this rebuild, while they also had two receivers. It's also cool to look at some of these stats and see recruiting-wise that Brent Pry was so much more successful than Tony Elliott, but both colleges were still able to put so many different players on to the NFL, and that's going to conclude the first ever 1v1 battle in an NCAA football rebuild.